Here we go once more with an attempt to record a video about making a dance video using Unreal Engine. This has been beset with problems from power cuts to irritating dogs to teenage caterwauling to problems with screen capture recording software. But um, this hopefully is the final um, unproblematic attempt to do so. Um, from previous iterations, I think this will last around about the hour mark if I can uh, restrict my digressions, of which this is one. But without any further ado, um, let me explain what we're going to do and then do it hopefully in a uh, quick time. So um, we're going to make a dance video. I'm going to show you the one I made. Uh, hopefully you'll make one that is both different and better. Uh, having done that, I'm going to go through the process of how you get hold of the tools and assets you need uh, in order to make a dance video. I'm then going to um, point out the various steps that I went through uh, that I think uh, usefully you might go through in the, the same sort of order. And then uh, I'm just going to take it into uh, Premiere Pro to tidy it up uh, so we have a final output. So without any further ado, let's first of all look at the um, video. I think this is the not that fella, um, but this is the one. Okay, I'm just gonna um, give a commentary over the top of this. Uh, it is available separately as a video if you want to uh, kind of get a sense of the full um, awesome wonderfulness of what I managed to knock up in two or three hours. Uh, but anyway, so it starts off with a shot that looks very much reminiscent of Talking Head's Stop Making Sense cover, that kind of close up of the jacket. And then we pull out and then as the music kicks off, we use that as a motivation to cut to a different angle from below and to the side. And then um, again, we go to first of the flyby shots. This, um, because of the time constrictions, if I was tidying up, I'd probably keep the character in frame and pay more attention to uh, focus. Um, we then cut to a very different shot. Uh, which is the one I really like. The foot movement really works well on the floor there and the occlusion and also the foreground blur. Um, so this, I'm not sure it's that believable. The arms look a bit too thin, but that's the quality of the model. And I do pull in too close. If I was to do this again, I'd probably stop the uh, camera moving before we get that close to the face. Um, this is slightly abstract. Again, if I was to do this again, I'd probably uh, pull out slightly so the head isn't bursting the bottom of the frame. This one, although I haven't used pull focus um, in this particular video, what I have done here is set the point of focus to be in the background, so the light coming in, um, and the kind of slightly dreamy movements of the dancer are um, blurred in the foreground. This is uh, very much a TV show um, angle shot there, coming in from that angle. And then we cut to, uh, this is the second of the flybys. I managed to get the character um, in the frame um, to at least some degree all the way through, but again, um, I'd probably attend to the focus if I was spending more time on this. And then we lead out to the kind of outro, so we we'll repeat a previous shot now. This is the to the side and down below shot. And then for the final shot, the music ends abruptly, so what I've done is um, have her stop in anticipation of that and then use a, a pull away and then fade to black. So, no, just stop. Okay, so Unreal Engine. Uh, it's available from this site here, unrealengine.com. I'll put the links in the description down below. And it's a two-stage process uh, in that you download the Epic's Game Launcher, which is the kind of front end for all things uh, Epic, and then you download the engine and then you can get going. So uh, what you do is go up here, uh, there's a button top right called Download, Click that, and then you want to choose Creator's License. It's available for Mac, PC, and Linux. Download uh, that particular file. And when you've done that, um, I'm not sure, because I obviously signed up some time ago, you, uh, at some point, you need to provide your email address to have an account. But what you should end up with is, once you've run the program, is this icon here, the Epic's Epic Game Launcher. <clears throat> and when you load that, you'll come up with this screen here like this. Make sure you're on the Unreal Engine tab here. There are various other elements here. And you want to go to the Library tag. Your screen here will be uh, blank if it's the first time you've run the program. And um, what we're gonna be doing is loading an engine. 
uh, these are uh, numerically ordered. The most recent one, the one you'll be getting, is 4.26, and um, other elements that are stored in your library are the projects that you're working on, and then below that, the assets that you've imported from the marketplace that you use in your projects. So if you click this, as I've already got it, it will come up with a different version. Um, and then you simply click the install button. Now this file is 10 gigs plus in size. So you do need a bit of uh, hard disk space. I would recommend uh, probably about 50 gigs um, to, to get you going. It is really quite that large. I'm not going to do that. But if you click install, that's going to take a while. So while we're doing that, what we're going to do is gather some other assets. So that will be downloading in the background. We'll return to that shortly. So the first of these is the character and the animation itself. If you go to a site mixamo.com, this is part of the Adobe Empire, but thankfully, rather than requiring a paid monthly subscription as part of Creative Cloud, you simply need an, o Ado oh, an Adobe ID. So again, it's a principle of providing an email, verifying that password, um, and then you're in. So then you can access this site. And there are two uh, elements to this. Let's um, as you can see, I've numerous attempts working through this. Uh, the first is to determine the character that you want in. So, sorry about that, I logged in, logged out. Um, so, you come to this site and we go to characters. Uh, I chose the Susie character here, um, but because I've done this so many times now, I'm just gonna choose a different character. Um, let's choose Malcolm. So, I've settled on Mac, you can choose whatever character you like. Um, first thing we need to do is download the character. You come up with this prompt, just leave the default settings, i.e. FBX binary and T-pose. And this will download um, the mesh, i.e. the kind of skeleton, uh, and the uh, textures and materials that constitute this character. So this is the largest of files you'll be downloading from this site. Uh, once we've got that, we're then gonna download animations that uh, we can put onto this particular mesh. So if I go to the animations tab, uh, there are thousands of these things, um, so 52 pages um, of different animations. So to kind of narrow down your choices, if you click search box, first of all, because we're doing dance video, um, we can um, just you know restrict that to dance. And I worked with um, my kind of sense or Adobe sense of what might constitute hip hop movements. There's a whole raft of these, as you can see, um, supposedly four pages worth of these. And you find one that you like or you think might work. Um, so that one there. Now, um, my sense is that they've kind of color coded these mannequins here to suggest that blue is more suitable for males and pink for um, uh, females which is quite quaint, but any animation can go on any character. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and what you will find, uh, you can click and drag through here like this to see it from different perspectives, is that you can uh, you get a, a varying types of sliders, depending on the, the animation itself, as to, um, I don't like that one. Uh, let's try that one. Okay, none of these are the ones I chose before, but. So, uh, we got this one, and what you may find, if you choose a character who's particularly bulky or like uh, strangely proportioned, that you may get the limbs or um, the other elements piercing uh, where they shouldn't do, like, you know, actually crossing into the body, which is why you have parameters like character arm space. So I could ramp that right up, and now the arms are way away from the body. Um, it's a question of tweaking for preference and uh, just out of believability. Um, things like, I don't know what focus would do. Does that mean he's kind of like, now I'm gonna be really unfocused. Yeah, looking down at the ground. Uh, now looking up, stance, play with those as you see fit. And when you're happy with the animation, almost all of these loop, there is an exception for those where there is movement involved, um, but that I'm not gonna cover that here. But let's assume this is an animation that kind of stays largely on the spot, so I could have multiple iterations of that. As you can see, there's no kind of jump when we go from the end of the animation to the beginning. Now, when you click download here, um, the option is slightly different. 
keep it on FBX binary. Because you've downloaded the mesh, you don't need to download the whole skin and materials again, so choose without skin, keep it at 30 frames a second, um, and don't worry about keyframe reduction. So then download uh, that. Okay, and that's a much smaller file, so it's only um, half a megabyte, whereas these are kind of typically 30 or 40 megabytes because they've got all the textures in them. So go through, choose a bunch of them. Uh, for the video I made, uh, I got about nine of them, so I had some flexibility. You can always come back here and get some more um, to add to your collection to kind of uh, get the look that you're after. And as I said, you can have multiple characters, then some maybe just sitting around um, in the background of the scene we're going to create, that's entirely up to you. But that's the process of getting a character and then some animations. And now what we're going to do is get some audio. Now, you can um, use any audio that you want. The, the only requirement is that it be a WAV file. So we'll cover um, uh, converting a um, MP3 to WAV, because MP3 uh, being largely more uh, readily available. But um, what I'm going to suggest you do, simply because um, there are, if you're going to publish to YouTube and, and distribute, which is the most obvious kind of route to do that, then um, if you sign up for a YouTube account, which obviously you need to do to publish to YouTube, then you will have access to their audio library. So when you've signed up to YouTube, I'm not going to go through it, usual kind of password, um, email address verification um, thing applies. But uh, one of the things you'll have access to is their audio library. So if I was to remove these filters, the one I ended up was with this lucky duck. I've heard the thing to death now, so I'm not going to play it again. Um, but you've got various filters that you can use here um, to name the genre. So I went with dance and electronic, but you know, you take your fancy. It depends on the, the kind of uh, dance movements. So you could choose your music first and then use that to inform dance movements. Um, entirely up to you. Uh, the, the mood. Um, so make your choice. I would uh, say in terms of duration, I would not choose anything longer than two minutes for your first video, simply because um, two minutes is a long time to um, you know, maintain interest and to find different perspectives and to find the right combination of movements, uh, particularly if this is the first time that you're doing this. So I can set sh shorter than two minutes. I can sort by duration or various other kind of qualities so you just preview these by teaching you to suck eggs uh, when you're happy with it if you hover over this it'll tell you whether you do need to just put a name check in the description um, but you won't get uh, copyright strikes or any other kind of content limitation hence the reason I'm suggesting this might be a good way to go so what you do is you choose the track you like I don't even know what this sounds like I'm gonna download this jack-in-the-box comes as an mp3 so um, Easiest way to resolve this, you can, you know, if you've got Audacity or Audition, you can do it that way. But if you haven't, you can go to, um, let's uh, back up here. So I searched MP3 to WAV. This is a uh, website here. It just asked me to drop my files there. So I go to downloads, find that what was I, uh, jack in the box, wasn't it? Has it downloaded yet? Let's have a look. There it is, Silent Partner. Upload that, so it's uploading there like that. When it's uploaded, it shouldn't take long because it's only a small file. Start conversion, starts changing it to WAV. When that's done, there should be a download link there. Much larger file, uh, it's a different file format, not as compressed. Uh, so now I've got my character, I've got some animations, and I've got a music track. I'm hoping by this point, um, that we will be somewhere along to you having one of these uh, shiny blue um, things here that indicate that the engine has downloaded and installed and that means that you're now ready to launch so you can click the launch button and I will do this uh, now so we can follow along so launching engine 4.26 and um, this will prompt a series of screens because you're launching a new project and what the engine will attempt to do is to kind of get a sense of the nature of the project and tailor the initial resources available to you to suit. So um, and come up with this launching screen. I am recording at the same time so it may be slower than it otherwise normally would be. And then this is it. So it's saying, do you really want this? So you can see various iterations of with the crashes and stuff <laughs> so many times. Um, 
I'm just going to tell you what to click here. So we're going to choose games for this. We're going to choose third person. If you want to see what the others do, if you click on them, get a description here. We're just going to go with third person. And for this final screen, um, go with these settings. Blueprint, maximum quality, ray tracing disabled, desktop slash console, and with starter content. The only thing you need to do now is to uh, either locate or go with the directory it suggests and give it a name. So this is the sixth time of asking, so this is going to be called Dance 6. Create the project. And now it will return to launching the engine, but this time fully informed by the choices that you previously made. So after a little moment here, what we should find is that we get the, yes, there it is, the rectangular box. It's coming up launching and we'll go into the engine. Now we're not going to spend any time looking at the wonder of the engine at this point. Hopefully I'll talk through the necessary things you need to complete the exercise as we go along. But the first thing we're going to do um, is to actually uh, get one more element, which is the environment in which we're going to place this dance. And um, having uh, gone through the marketplace, because this is where we're going to find it, uh, do I need to launch games launcher again? Yes, it seems to close. Let's come down here and call it up. Epic Game Launcher. Marketplace. What I want to do is to find an environment, um, and for the purposes of, of, of trying to be as, as kind of universal as possible, I've chosen uh, a low polygon, i.e. kind of one that isn't particularly large in size and shouldn't overly tax um, you know, a wide variety of machines. So that largely informed my choice. And it's from um, a game I've never heard of, to be honest. My ignorance is called Edith Finch. And um, these are made freely available to the community for download and use um, for their projects. And as you can see, there's a variety of environments. Um, I kind of went with uh, this one. And um, what you do, so as you can see, I've downloaded several of these already. Uh, these are free. You can um, pay ridiculous amounts of money for assets. But the same principle applies. I can't download this again. But to download this, I just choose Add to Cart. So I'm choosing a different one here, you see. It appears there as a little kind of, you've got stuff in your cart. And just choose Checkout. And then that will appear in my Vault page, my Vault section, rather, in the library. So here's the Vault with all the things I've downloaded, okay? So if I go up here, I can search for Edith. You'll have gone for the cannery one. Uh, is it called cannery? Cannery and low poly something or other. Um, if you look at the details, um, click on this. Cannery and low poly kingdom. Uh, I think this bit must be map two, which I've never had the curiosity in all the times I've done this to look at, but I'm gonna stick with map one, the interior with the salmon, uh, which you'll come to know and love. So let's go back to the library, and it's this one here. I click, uh, again, this is what I need to do. Go back to the project just briefly and save it so it actually exists as a project. So just go File, um, Save All. Because having done that, I can now go back, and if I look through my projects, there should be Dance 6 appears in the alphabetical list. Dance, Dance 6, there it is. Okay, so now it exists as a project, which enables me to say when add to project, I can go, yep, yeah, you select dot six, please. Add to project. Shouldn't take too long because this is only, I say only 486 megabytes. Some of these run to 10, 15 gigabytes and you, know, you need um, a lot of hard disk space and a machine that can push around a lot of pixels. Um, to actually work with that. It doesn't take too long, that's kind of done now, so I can go back here. And if I go, um, I've got two tabs up here, one called Sequencer, which is largely where we're gonna be working, but it's currently empty, and Content Browser. And you navigate through the kind of folders here by the top level folders called Content, and underneath that, Subfolders, and some of those have subfolders. But the one we just added, um, I have to take my word for it, is this one, EF Lewis, EF for Edith Finch. If I double click this. Um, now at the moment, what we're seeing in here, this is a viewport, this is where we kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, this is a level, consists of a variety of elements. Uh, those elements are listed down here like this. And there is, uh, there are a couple of levels in this. As I say, haven't looked at demo map two. 
Um, go ahead, maybe use that for uh, your project. I'm going to work with this one, um, but that may be more interesting. That's something for me to look forward to, and it's good to have something to look forward to. So I'm gonna launch this, and it will change this environment. Uh, it may take a little longer for you to load. I have been uh, working on this previously, so it loaded quite quickly. And as we can see, um, what the extent of it, I'm using the arrow keys to navigate uh, through this world. And I can change the speed at which I do that, which you may find necessary, by changing this slider here. So if I've set it to one now, and now we'll have glacial progress through the world, which, you know, it's just not going to work. I also don't want to set it to eight, because it will just flip through so quickly. Let's just set it on three for the time being, and that's maybe kind of approximate there. So um, what I did for the previous video, I'm going to do here, just for ease of understanding, I'm going to place the... A character there, animate the character, um, have various cameras around the space, and uh, that's going to be it. Now, in a th third person environment, uh, you actually have a mannequin that you can move around the space. Uh, there is one here, so I press this, you'll see uh, for some reason he's kind of bursting the furniture. We don't want this character in the scene, um, it's just showing you what happens. So, you know, I can click here and then okay. whatever. Um, but let's actually physically get rid of him so he doesn't appear. So just go player. So I can search through the elements of the scene. And it's player start. Delete that. Now be gone. He's no longer there. All right. So let's remove that and just talk briefly about navigating the environment. Here um, in the world outliner is a list of all the elements in the scene. And um, perversely, yeah, for adults video, there are at least 42 salmon in this scene. If I highlight one of these and press F, it navigates to where that creature is. Salmon 32 is there. Where's salmon 28, you wonder? It's there. Uh, so that's a way to quickly get to particular elements in the scene. One of the first things I'm gonna do, because it's just all eye candy, we're just gonna get hold of these, uh, and to get them out of the way, I'm just gonna go move to create new folder, and uh, unimaginatively call it stuff. Okay, so now I can close out that folder and that clears out um, that. And you know, because I highlighted everything, you can see we've got all those things here. So whatever I'm, I've clicked on will be uh, you know, highlighted by those kind of things there, like that. Okay, so um, this is the scene, and if you recall from the, the video we started off with, I placed the character here, I'm gonna do exactly the same there. Um, you know, complete lack of imagination. I'm sure you'll find a more interesting um, perspective. As you'll notice in this scene, it's got some moving elements like these conveyor belts. Uh, it might be, and I'm not gonna go through how you might do this, I could have an overhead scene, which I didn't actually do. Have the camera rotating like that as the dance is going on. I'm not going to do that either uh, at the moment anyway, uh, but you might put objects on that, animate those, and the conveyor belts could be meaningful rather than just pointlessly kind of uh, doing what they're doing at the moment. So if you recall, I'm going to largely replicate what I did in the video. First thing I want to do is to bring in my assets. So that's the animation, the uh, character, and the audio. So let's go back up to content. Let's create a new folder so they're all in the same place and call this my assets. Open that, right click, choose import. Now I need to navigate. I'm gonna go with the um, character I used previously, although we did download the other fella. Um, oh no, let's go for the other fella. I'm just tired of that other one. Uh, if I can remember, was it Malcolm? Was it Malcolm? What a question. Let's assume it was Malcolm. Um, I know, but those animations are for the other, no, I'm gonna go. Oh dear. Um, here we are, here is Susie, I think, as was. And it comes up with this screen because it is what's called a skeletal mesh. And I just leave everything like that and just choose import and it will load in the skeleton, it will load in the textures um, and it will appear as T-pose because we downloaded this separate from the animations itself. So very quickly, um, don't worry about that. So a bunch of files that relate to creation of this character here. I'm gonna go up here and choose File, Save All, and then these little stars will disappear, indicating that that has been saved. So we've got that in there. Now let's get the animations. 
So the ones I downloaded for um, the Susie character, um, I did them yesterday, didn't I? So um, yeah, it's this whole clutch here, but not the character. So you can use Shift to highlight a range and then Control to click to exclude some. So they're all animations, as you can see the difference in. Uh, that's a don't want that one either because that's a massive file. So these are all kind of lightweight files. So, um, and it's identified that yes, it wants to go to that skeleton. So these are gonna be um, placed on that skeleton. I just click import all, and that will bring all of those in. Now, well, depending on the number of animations you've initially selected, it may take a bit of time. Um, it's kind of the files themselves aren't very large, but if you imagine that it's providing information for um, each 30th of a second for the location and rotation of, um, I think there's about 50 bones uh, that it identifies. It may be more than that, but there's information for like the different joints in the fingers um, and all the various other bones that constitute the skeleton. So um, it's a one time operation, you just need to bring that in. Then we bring in the audio, then we've got everything that we need to work with already in the scene. And we can then go about uh, manipulating stuff to create a pleasing, or at least um, a durational video. Let's leave pleasing out of it for the moment. So here we go. Um, I could have brought in less because I'm only gonna, um, so what I'm gonna be doing next is once the audio's in, is I'm going to be showing you um, essentially finding key points in the audio, then doing a little bit of how you might blend animations together, then a little bit of how you might get from one camera to another. I'm not going to rebuild the whole video because, um, as I say, it took me two to three hours to, to knock up the video. If I'm then stopping and explaining the steps and the reason I'm doing certain things, then that exponentially increases and you know people have lives uh well other people have lives <laughs> and um yeah it's one's patience will be tested to the extreme so we're nearly there i'm run out of things to say anyway so that's good uh just save all again here we go and uh the audio yeah so one last thing we need to bring in and it was, I'm going to use the one before, uh, Lucky Duck, because i kind of <laughs> sick as I am of that track. Uh, so it's a WAV file, make sure it's the WAV converted file, and that's there as well, so I could save that. Yeah, save all. Everything's saved, everything's in there. And as per previously, what I'm going to do is, um, I could mix it up and just have the character facing the other way, couldn't I, with the exit sign? Could I? Yeah, that's what I say. Um, Although, to be honest, the angles are... No, let's just have the exit sign and worry about the angles later. So, um, I move around the environment. Uh, I can use the uh, the mouse to... Um, so I'm holding down the what would be the uh, right mouse button and rotating around here. I can use the arrow keys to move in and out and left to right and change the speed of it, as I showed by using this thing up here. And um, if I want to go to a particular object in the scene, I highlight it, press F, and then it will um, frame that in the center of the viewport. Uh, this is the perspective viewport. At other points, you may be wanting to use these to like precisely locate things, left, right, bottom, center, and so on. But we're going to stick with the perspective. The other thing you may want to change is if the scene's quite dark and you want to do some um, find stuff and see edges more clearly. If you go to the unlit version, um, it doesn't occlude certain things with shadows on whatever else. So that's useful to bear in mind as well. Let's get our character, put them in there. So here is Susie. First thing I'm probably gonna do is actually change her name to Susie so it's apparent. In fact, let me come out of that. Did I do the stuff thing? Yes, good. Thank heavens. Right. There she's outside of that folder, so I can just clearly see the stuff I've brought in. Susie, as is. Now, she's between those gantries. Uh, when I drop a character in, it's highlighted. Uh, by default, it comes up with this gizmo here. Three things. They, they determine its placement in X, Y, and Z um, coordinates. And I can click and drag these arrows to move in the direction indicated. Sometimes you may need to move around to actually access and um, 
moving in a particular direction. It's just about possible here to get all three of those, that's good. Uh, and as I do so, you'll notice that it changes the values down here. I could enter the values here if I wanted, or click and do that. Okay, let's say we want the character round about there. Um, obviously, I'd like to start off with her facing front as well. So, um, the various challenges we want. We want to get a stood on the carpet facing front, uh, sort of midway between the gantries. Um, so I can use these arrows to roughly get the position. Now, um, that only gets me movement. The other elements of the gizmo I can use are rotation and scale. So the three keys are W is this one here, which is the movement on the axes. E, perversely, is for rotation. And R is for scale. So I'm just iterating through those. That's W, that's E. So I can now click and drag these or alter here. And that's R for scale. With scale, typically, although less likely to scale up a, a human uh, figure because you know that's proportional to the world that we built. If you click this, then you can um, proportionally scale in all uh, dimensions rather than have it get just taller and nothing else. So it's worth bearing in mind. We're not going to worry about scaling, but we are going to rotate the character. So you go. Um, and thankfully, this environment is organized in such a way that 90 degrees does conform with um, the perpendicular and the angles that work. Uh, now, less so if, now, this is a bit which we zoom in. And if we can't zoom in without it not working, uh, we may find that, because uh, floor contact is quite important in terms of believability. So you may find... Uh, in this instance, I don't think it's too bad, but say for instance, you think uh, those shoes aren't making contact with the floor. Well, first of all, this is an instance where you go unlit because I'm gonna be able to see it a bit more clearly. And you can see where we're getting the cresting of the floor. If I zoom, yeah, you, see this. you see there, the yellow line is broken with a kind of hatched line that suggests this is making contact. So that's good, we're just cresting that. But it may be in some instances where this granularity, see, it's, it's, it's snapping to a grid of 10 units. A unit is one centimeter in Unreal. So if I click down, we're now 10 centimeters below the floor. Now we're actually where we want to be. But if I did want some more fine grain movement, I can turn off this un this snapping thing and then just pull it up you know, in minuscule ways, or even use uh, this here to get the value I want. I'm gonna press Control Z to undo that and turn the snapping back on because I'm happy with where that sits at the moment. So let's move out here. We've got the character in the scene between the gantries so that's a starting point, that's good. Let's turn on uh, lit again, one more time. Now, uh, one of the uh, things I realized uh, just before I exported was uh, the scene is pretty dark and um, you can go to town with all element, all madness of uh, kind of lighting here, uh, animate the lights, have different colored lights. Uh, so really create a kind of Studio 54 feel if that's your intent. I'm just gonna put a practical light in this scene just to get a bit more illumination on the subject. So to do that, I'm gonna go here to lights, different types of lights you can add. Point light is the one I'm gonna use, is rather like a kind of light bulb, as indeed the illustration suggests. So it's gonna chuck out light in all directions. Whereas the spotlight um, will give you a more kind of theatrical feel because you can target the light. Um, you can have narrow beam, wide beam. Um, but we're gonna go with this one here. So I'm gonna click and drag this into the scene, okay? Now, the minute I do that, you'll get an error message coming up. I expect, yeah, there it is. Lighting needs to be rebuilt. Um, now I can move this light around and you can see dynamically it's showing me the effect of that light. That is pretty severe. I think that's gonna look like an interrogation scene, not a dance movie. Uh, again, I could do this just for ease of comprehension because I might add other lights. Let's call this light 01. Um, all right. Now this is uh, the, the point at which I might start off by using different views because I can't really get a feel for it there. So if I go to the top view, uh, now there's my light there. And if I hold down the button and I can zoom in by using the scroll wheel. I can position this a bit back from the character using that perspective and then I can go to the left view here and see, yeah, I wanna come up a bit. I can't see um, up and down in a top view but I can see it there like that. So it's slightly above, uh, down on the subject so it's there like that. Now let's go back to the perspective view because then what I wanna do 
is to come in here and change the intensity. So that's the light off. That's ridiculous. Um, what I want is is just it to be illuminated, not to the point where I think that's a bright light on someone, but where I can see what's going on. So in this instance, um, I'm going to go with four, maybe a bit overly bright. You can tweak this. No, actually, yeah, all right, let's go with six. And now you can see it's generating shadows as well. Um, I can change things like the attenuation radius. So the light itself, it doesn't appear in the scene. The light itself is there. And how far do the beams from that light extend outwards? So you can see here as I extend outwards onto that character. So if I just wanted the top half of them lit, I could do that. Spotlight would probably give you more effective use of that. Now it does appear to be a bit bright at that level. So now I might take it down to five. Okay. So less light on the feet there. I could cheat in more lights to have um, do a three-point light set up using uh, more spotlight type things. I'm just going to go with that. It's quick and easy. I've set the light there like that. Now let's deal with the rebuilding the light. I click this. Um, this is working out the changes to the kind of reflections uh, and shadows in the scene. Um, so when you make major changes to the lighting, you'll get this um, message coming up. And because it's quite a complex scene, um, it will take a moment. And um, you will sometimes get error messages. You will on this scene because it identifies that those pesky salmon that exist in this scene, um, they are overlapping and it's causing some issues with the lighting. Um, feel free to remove the salmon because, it, you know, speed it up slightly. There's less kind of clutter in it. But they're just... Um, you know, what music video has ever been made that doesn't have piles of salmon sitting around um, just to give it that certain, um, I was say, quiet. So here we are, the building of the lighting. Um, I may just ramble on, I may cut this bit out. Um, I'm just past the point of carry, to be honest. Um, but we're just building through the lighting. I Hopefully it will speed up. I'm so hoping this screen recorder is not gonna fall over this time because that would be um, desperate. Um, so it's just uh, working out the lighting. I can, um, I can actually carry on doing stuff looking around the, the scene, which might be a useful um, way of, of, of passing uh, the time. Uh, I can't add more lights, well I could, but then I've got to do the lighting again. So I'm gonna just go with that light. I've got sufficient illumination on this scene now, so I'm gonna live with that. So while that's um, chugging away in the background, let's see, I should be able to um, now go to adding what's called a sequence. So I'll check, check add level sequence. I need to save it somewhere. I'm gonna put it in my folder called My Assets and same numbering convention again, this is gonna be sequence 01, okay. And what you'll notice is, we've got two tabs here, Content Browser, which is where all my stuff is, uh, arranged in various folders, and the sequencer is more akin to what you might find in something like uh, a non-linear video editing program. So it's timeline and you drop tracks in here and events happen on tracks along here. So this is the place where we're gonna add our character and their animations, our audio, and then cameras. Now we can choose anything we bring in here, we can then animate over time using keyframes, another concept um, from uh, video and motion graphics programs. Because uh, I am not going to do anything with the light. I've just added it as a static element to the scene. I'm not gonna bother creating a track for that. But if I wanted that camera to, you know, kind of move, rotate, um, do all manner of, of fancy stuff, maybe pulse in terms of the level of brightness, I'd add it to here and add keyframes to that to change it over time. Um, that is for another time. But everything we add over here, we can then um, animate so we're just about done with the lighting. Massive message about your salmon are not working for you comes up and there you go, salmon, 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 ignore. Or delete, okay. So we have a character here, now it exists in the world, but it doesn't exist in the, the film that we're gonna be making. So that's fine, but we, we should um, bring the character in so that we can apply animations to them. So we highlight the character there and we go here and we choose track add actor to sequencer and the top one the one you've highlighted comes here so usefully I can do that and now Susie has a track now in Susie's instance for the purposes of this I'm not going to be 
moving the, the kind of position Susie finds herself in, I'm just going to be using animations. So I'm not going to need to make use of the transform. This is basically these characters here that I can keyframe so I can move uh, left, right, and center, up and down, rotate, scale, should I see fit. So it might be useful if, if you really wanted to go for it. Um, so you could highlight this thing, add it, attract to it, and then this cart could roll through the scene um, over the course of the animation if it so took your fancy. These salmon could randomly flap about if that was um, really your um, intent, but um, you probably don't need a video tutorial. You probably need counselling if that's um, what you're up to. Anyway, we're not going to uh, spend any more time on all things uh, Piscean. We are going to focus on Susie and her moves. So Susie is in there. Um, the elements I am going to be uh, working with is the animation and I'm going to drop those animation files in here bring them together move them around get something that looks pleasing and makes sense with the music talking of the music we need to bring the music in so uh, I think we did import the music see um, now yes we did there it is so we go up here track add an audio track and what we need to do now is find the audio track. These are arranged alphabetically, the one um, I'm now um, hoping never to hear again is Lucky Duck. There you go. So, um, Lucky Duck appears and because the playback bar was on 000, that's where it's appeared. Now, uh, for reasons that become more apparent later, I actually want to have this um, on frame 100. Remember, we got this at 30 frames a second. So frame 100 is going to be about three and something frames in. So I move this to here, and because I've got snap on, this will snap to that point there like that. So now I've got the music there. If I was to put the playback head there, press space bar, and there it is. Okay, now um, Susie exists in this movie, but nothing's happened. She's just going to stay as that T pose um, until the crack of doom. So we actually need to do something with Susie next. But before we do that, um, now I should point out that if you're familiar working with a kind of timeline based uh, interfaces, we've got um, a work area here, green bar start, red bar to end. Now the final video, I'm just gonna set it for that, but the final thing that I showed you earlier was actually 3,700 frames by the time I had intro and outro going on. I'm just gonna set my work area to that area um, but I'm not actually um, going to be focusing on that. Uh, believe me, I'm not going to do all 2, 3,700 frames or whatever it is. Uh, now I'm just going to show you the principles that inform building the animations and the soundtrack. First thing I'm, I'm going to actually do is the soundtrack. And what I'm going to do is uh, use a technique that uh, may be familiar if you've worked with Premiere, which is to provide markers at certain points where you want things to happen or you think mark significant changes um, in what's occurring. I'm going to use it for the audio track, and this is a very kind of conventional straight down the line audio track in that it's got four bar sections with uh, an intro and an outro. So um, I'm going to play back it back and I'm going to press the M key, which provides a marker. These are arranged alphabetically. Um, I'm just going to do it for a little bit of the track to illustrate the point, but you would typically do it for the entirety of the track. And then it gives you kind of guides, which you can selectively ignore or work around and with. So here we go. etc so you can see um, these uh, depending on uh, my reaction time and my ability to determine beats should be you know, equidistantly placed apart it's going to look quite um, tedious after a while if I cut exactly to the beat so what I'm going to do is use these as kind of guides 
and I might go slightly before or slightly afterwards or ignore them completely depending on the, the way in which the music is developing. But I've now got, if you like, kind of a, a structural uh, frame around which I might construct the animation. So let's turn to the animation. So the animations I add to Susie's track and by default it comes up with uh, an animation track. And to start with, what I'm probably going to do is just pull uh, maybe three or four of them. I suggest about eight, nine, maybe ten to construct a video of this length, just to give you the variety. Depends on the length of the individual animation clips. But um, for argument's sake, I'm just going to pull in some. Um, I'm going to spread them apart so they're not overlapping and, and uh, basically corrupting what one looks like because it's blending into another. So just going through. And okay, so uh, those who've not used um, certain programs. The way you zoom or navigate using this is if you grab the end, zoom in, it'll zoom out like this, okay, and then grab the bar itself to move along. So I'm just doing that in order to get here. So now we want to go here. Uh, let's just bring in the first four. So hip hop one, two, three, and four. Um, Okay, so I've got um, four tracks I'm scrubbing through, so they're a little bit weird. And one more I'm going to bring in because this worked reasonably well um, previously. I can put it right back here. Is if you recall from the video, I started off with an idle animation, I she wasn't moving much, and then um, after we'd done the intro, I used that as a motivation for her to then suddenly kick into life. So. Uh, Let's just chuck it here for argument's sake. So it'd be under I after all the H's, I to four. Um, now you notice I can go um, before zero, zero, zero. Um, for the video I'm going to export, I'm going to start at zero, um, but I can have any amount of pre roll should I need it. So this idle animation is where I'm going to start off, and what I want to do. Uh, See, there it is, it's just uh, moving around like this. Um, what I want to do is, what's a good start one? Let's just scrub through. That's a bit too busy to start with. <laughs> Says he, the uh, acknowledged expert of hip-hop dancing. Um, and that's, no. That's that's probably a good one. Uh, see, it's kind of not too far from here. So. That's the one. We're going to start with track four. So let's pull track four back this way. Yeah. yeah thankfully, you've got multiple tracks here. But um, what I've got is move these. That's where it becomes slightly cumbersome. But I want to have them here. I can stack them up, but then it's more difficult to kind of preview them. Um, I just want these available so I can get a quick eyeball on what they look like. Um, so having settled on this as the first dance move, um, the so the intent here is the the music's kicking up and it's saying, yeah, I'm you know I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I know it's gonna like burst into life, and so am I. And um, so what we want to do is affect. See if I just butt these up one next to the other, it's going to be a bit too abrupt. There I am, just standing around waiting for something to happen, and then suddenly I'm just oh no. So how do we avoid that? Well, we can blend animations. So in effect, it's like a kind of uh, cross dissolve. Um, one animation gives way to another, and uh, the the artistry is in trying to find the ideal point where it looks uh, convincing and works with. Uh, the material you got to hand. So let's try this for instance. That was quite nice. Um, Alright, so my judgment may be slightly shot because I've been making this thing so many times. Uh, but yeah, initial response was yes, that that worked. It was more happenstance than anything else. Um, as I moved this, you notice I had snapping on. So if I wanted to get more granular, in the same way I could turn off snapping there. Um, if I turned that off, then I could move frame by frame, particularly if I zoomed right in to get that detail. But um, more by uh, accident than design, that seems to have worked okay. So we got from 
nothingness to first track. Now, this uh, raises the spectre of, uh, okay, uh, I could just ignore these beats, uh, but say I did want to hit this point here. Now, if I was to, let's try this overlap effect. If I was to simply try this overlap effect here, that might actually work, having said all this. But if I wanted to hit, and you have to use this with caution. But if I actually wanted to hit um, around this point here, like this, what I do, um, and there are limits to this because um, we will test the very bounds of credibility, is I can change the play rate of the animation. So by default, it's playing 100% or one in the, the kind of uh, lexicon of this program. If I play it at 0.5, then it's going to be half speed. If I play it at 2, it's going to be twice the speed. If you go to those kind of extremes, uh, it's either very self-consciously um, slow-mo, or else if you speed it up that much, it's not going to be realistic. A human being cannot move at that speed. But smaller increments are kind of, you know, I officially sanction you to use smaller increments if you fancy it. I mean, just try it. If it looks right, fine. At the moment, this is slightly too long to get us leading out of this um, animation at that point. It didn't look too bad overlapping where we did, but if we wanted a shift in the move, that kind of sent that that suggested that she was changing her dance moves to to mark a kind of development in the music. Then we'd want the end of this track to be round about this area, so we could do a blend here. So what we do is probably come up here and reduce the the. So I want it to be shorter, so I need to speed it up. Yeah. So a moment is one. Um, let's try one point one so that will be effectively 10 percent faster that only gets us to there so we're now getting to the point where i think beyond 10 percent we're in uncharted territory let's try 1.15 yeah okay um this may look now we might get away with that because it's not i don't think she's doing anything that is really frenetic to start with. So you could probably, if you wanted it, usually it works, I think, better if it if the blend is occurring either on the beat or even slightly before it. Yeah, again. Um, now, please accept, it may be that, because it's got wrong so many times with the screen capture thing, it may be that I have lost all kind of sense of what things look like. I may not even be staring at the screen you're looking at. I may be just a... Anyway, um, that doesn't look too bad to me, and I'm moving through this. Um, when I was doing it, I was trying to think A, variety is one thing, uh, B, the kind of quality of the music, uh, the believability of the action. So in isolation, some of the animations I downloaded, when I looked at them, um, they just looked a bit pants in the context of the other ones I'd chosen. So, you know, don't be afraid to uh, junk stuff and go and get some more should you need to. Uh, and uh, what was the other element uh, as well? So variety, believability, working with uh, the music. Ah, another thing is some of the animations you'll find that uh, although we kept the character in the same spot they may be doing a bit of uh, walking around so you know this character might for instance do a few steps over here a few steps back a few steps forward uh, if you're cutting mid animation if they're over there and the the other animation you're cutting to stays rigidly locked to this kind of origin point here then the character is going to seemingly jump from over here where they're stepping to the beginning of the animation loop for the other thing so what's that kind of thing i don't think we're guilty of that thing. um we've been fairly yeah you see she steps back there but then thankfully comes back so we're all good there like that so hopefully that's enough to show you the principles that are informing me doing the animation uh, for the end, I did a revert to the idle state because 
we just play the end of the music you notice it stops abruptly so I had her kind of acknowledging that and actually stopping before the final bit of the music to say yeah I know this track um, we're done here. so she's stopping here so she's not caught by surprise you know, indicating to her fellow dancers if we'd bother to populate the space with them. And you might want to try doing that. Um, there aren't many perching places, but people could be standing idling around. You can use those as uh, opportunities for pull focus or cutting for reaction shots. Um, so feel free to, to go beyond the, the very limited uh, scope I applied to, to this. One other thing I did, because it's quick and easy and just to show you the kind of things that you might do. Um, there is no motivation for it, simply because it would work better instead of this, I think it looks like industrial grade um, kind of runner carpet. If this was grating, you know, with the holes and stuff below it, then it would make a lot more sense and I'd stick more of them in. But if I go to my starter content, go to particles, uh, a bit of steam, <laughs> wow. Um, it's steam on top of the character. Is that on top of the character? What's happening there? Is it because it's in front of the character? Yeah. See, that's maybe a bit too much. In fact, it's probably too much. I would, you know, if, it, if there was a motivation for this steam, I'd probably put the origin point on the grating itself. Um, you can tweak the you know, parameters by which these particles are generated. But I would, you know, create the suggestion that there is um, some unpleasant vent underneath, you know, full on, um, salmon odors coming up which again doesn't really endear one to wanting to be in this space and empathize with this character but a bit of steam it, it gives some dynamism to the piece so let's go back to the sequencer we've established the means by which we might get into the piece and how we'll blend things and like being mindful of these cuts let's move on to um getting a camera in the scene and um, doing a similar principle, how we go from one camera to another, some of which draws on, you know, principles about um, motivation for um, camera movement, so on and so forth. I'm not going to go into that in great depth, but it's just to, to kind of maintain interest and uh, dynamism in the piece itself. So cameras, uh, as with lights, are things uh, that, let's get rid of my stuff thing here, we can drop into the scene and they're under the cinematic tab. And the way I tend to work I'm quite close to that gantry I'm not I'm not don't worry about it so the way I tend to work is I before I add the camera to the sequencer I get it roughly in the position uh, that I want because um, I'm not setting any keyframes so I, I needn't get overly anxious about that so the one you want is cine camera actor drop it in the scene it won't be facing the direction you want it to go so now it's piercing a body uh, here I get a, a viewport showing what the camera sees if I click this thing here, it pins it so that's always available. So I can use my gizmo here and obviously want to rotate it, pull back a bit, rotate. So at least I'm looking at the character, so 180 degrees that way. Um, pull back a bit more, there. See that smoke does make a deal. I know it's a bit cheesy, but it's, it's a bit background interest. Um, there are many other things that you could add to it. So let's change the framing for this, um, maybe go down a bit and then angle up. Yeah, let's do that. So here, angle, oh wait, so this is where the snapping thing comes in. You might think that's just too much, but uh, so I'd turn off the snapping for the angle. That's quite nice, but bear in mind, we're looking at it for the, yeah. So if I was being harsh, the, the kind of, I'd probably either get in tighter or further away because it's just just to the point at which the, the gap between the legs is visible and it's quite distracting so let's just pull back a bit more oh now you see there what, what would you do you'd there maybe pull back like ideally yeah pull back like that as the opening shot as she's standing there so so maybe that would be a starting position. We'll take the camera down. No. This is the angle I want to change, isn't it? Let's go to E. So here is where I turn off my degree thing here so I can be more granular in that. 
It's actually pulling back the camera, I think, to give us the shot I want. There. Right, let's try that. Turn back on the snapping here. So let's say we're, we're quite happy with that. Um, I'll just scrub through, that's the idle animation. Um, I mean, you could just you know, just have one camera and run that through, but it's it's like you know the interest is in showing us different things from different perspectives. So this is how I'm going to start with the camera. So if I'm happy with that roughly as a camera, first thing I want to do is make it more meaningful. I just tend to call these Cam 01. Rename all of them sequentially like that. Highlighted that there. Let's chuck it in to the sequence. Add Cam 01. It's now there. Now I'm going to create keyframes for the position of this camera because it's likely that I'm going to alter the, the parameters of that. I haven't done for uh, Susie character because she's going to stay on the spot um, you know, in more complex or different type of animation. I may well animate um, position in the frame, but not in this instance. So there's our opening shot there. What I'm going to do is, I'm in sequencer. Where have my tools gone? That's odd. Um, Oh, I know. What I want to do is go back to the beginning, zero, zero, zero. And what I tend to do, you may choose to do otherwise, um, but I tend to put keyframes for all the um, parameters I'm going to using, the initial ones, on frame zero. So I've always got that as a point of reference. Whatever I do later on in it, I can find out where that starting position was. So cam one here, to create keyframes, I just go down. Um, so I've got one for the aperture focal length and the focal distance, that's the point of focus, and I want to set them for transform. Um, not for the scale, because the camera is going to remain at the same scale throughout, but location, so if I click that one, it gives me X, Y, and Z, and rotation, which gives me the three axes of rotation, uh, roll, pitch, and yaw. So they, they're set at their initial position, right back there, as it were. Now, you can choose, you may find it like um, awkward or otherwise, but you can set this on. So every time you change it, without actively having to set a keyframe, if you alter a parameter, it will add one. So that toggles that on. But what I'm assuming is, um, I will probably, when I actually have the final video, be fading up from black at this point. So I'm, I'm maybe a few seconds in. So I'm gonna have my zero position but I want the camera to be moving, so I probably wouldn't start the video on the very first frame, it'd be black for a few frames, so the camera's already moving. So where's it gonna to move to? And I want the camera to be moving uh, throughout the shot, although I'm gonna cut before that. So at this point here, let's move the camera. And maybe that's just enough. Let's play that back and see what that looks like. <clears throat> okay, that that kind of works. I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive in that we're pulling away from it and not sufficiently so that there's mystery about where she is. We don't see so much more by the time we get to this point. Um, but I think it's 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 almost diffident the way that it's like, um, I'm just standing here, there's music playing, I don't care, you're moving away. Like So it's, it's almost uh, toying with you, saying, you know, well, you go away, I'm indifferent to what you're doing. So we need to have more of a punch and get right in close for the next shot, say, uh, full jab. Uh, so somewhere around this point here and the camera the next camera we go to is probably going to cut on the action um, to be convincing so we got one camera now already we are using this so we can see what's going on but the way you work effectively in sequencer is this viewport here you actually split so how do we do that we go up here choose layouts and we choose two panes uh, turn this one back to perspective so that's the old look that we had previously. But this one here changed from perspective to cinematic viewport. Now that immediately looks more impressive, doesn't it? Um, and that immediately generates a track up here called camera cuts. So this shows you the, the, the camera that you're going to. Um, so at the moment, 
to, to, to ensure that it works and cuts from one track to another, you need to highlight this item here. We've only got one camera in the scene at the moment, so it's of limited use. And this is showing us uh, what's happening. And before we move on to getting busy with other cameras, uh, we haven't really attended to some of the other characteristics of the camera that um, will make the difference between it looking okay to you know much better. So we can use these to go to the keyframe, there we are, on zero. And we've usefully now got these controls, so if I play it, you know, can be playing here, say no, we want to go back to zero, there's the front, because that's the start of the work area. Um, let's have a look at um, the actual focal length, and the aperture, and the focus. Yeah, one of my favorite things. <laughs> okay, um, one of the things I quite like about um, this is the, the tool for focus. And um, what you do is, it's on manual focus at the moment. If I change this, I could disable focus and it's got that you know computer game look of everything being in focus all the time, um, which is not the way uh, we like things. A more cinematic look is to kind of have uh, quite a narrow depth of feel for much of the stuff and then switch between that and uh, a wide or deep focus. So I've set it on manual focus. At the moment, uh, clearly her face is not in focus. I can resize these so we can get a bit more detail going on there, get a better sense of that. Um, so if I turn on this draw debug focus plane, um, because we've got this up there, we can see it in that window as well. What I can do is, um, move this plane. At some point you'll see this purple sheet um, come towards the camera and that is the point of focus. There it is getting closer. What we want is you know typically you'd have it on the eyes and um, whether we can get that granular. This is a point at which I might type in values when I get close just to tweak it up or down. But I'm just sliding this. It's getting closer. Soon it will envelop Susie herself. Are we getting closer? Yes, you can see. Here we get in there. We get in there. Um, I'm doing this ridiculously slowly. You can see clearly. Yeah. Now that's the point. Just the nose in focus there. That's roughly enough. Two nine three. Okay. So because we got this on, that's already adding that value there like that. Let's turn that off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've set that focal point there like that. But because we're pulling out, we may find that the focal distance changes by the time we get to here. So what we could usefully do, just to make sure we are there, because sometimes you can just miss this, but if you use these, it snaps to that. Um, let's do the same exercise again here. Um, yeah, you can see now, focal points move slightly. It's, instead of being 293, it's now 426-ish. Four two six. It's one of those cases, right? Four two six. That'll work for me. There. Now that means we get fairly because because camera's moving at constant rate. The the focus. I mean, I could tweak this more precisely, but I'm maintaining focus on the face as we pull back there like that. And this might be a good point now to think about. So um, I've had this kind of rather diffident camera here pulling away as you just stand there not bothered um, and then what I did uh, last time around I'll probably do it again because um, whatever I don't want to pin the previews that's come out of that uh, let's move around the scene to there she is where am I going to stick my next camera now, I've already done down below the, you know the principles uh, oh yeah I think last time uh, did this. I came up here and I got a. I could be. I mean, that's not bad. So let's just probably a bit too close there. Um, so it's on the body at the moment. Let's rotate that round. You know, something that thing becomes a pun. Rotate that round. That's a kind of angle of direction. And we need to pull out. And you know, we're not straight on. So we need to pull this way and this way. Um, this way. And this way, can't see that character yet. Real time. So if this happens, um, th there will be intermittent barkings from a dog. Um, I can only apologise. It's something that you only have to live with for the duration of this video. 
Right, um, real time now, we just need to find that. Yeah, so this is a point at which I'd say the pilot thing, but I never seem to get that to work the way I want. So there she is. Let's go up and point down. That's too close. So we're going this way, we're coming this way, and we're going up because we're now going to go down and do the angle. Um, this is the right one. Yeah. Um, now, the thing to be testing here, uh, this is why I do it before I put it on timeline, is I'm going to see it in there. <laughs> Okay, so I'm probably gonna, um, I can only apologize. Shut up, go away. Lord. Right. Um, so for that period of time, that sort of works. Um, now I'm actually thinking now, but why would you? But there is a potential here to do a pull focus from the salmon to the character. Don't. It's just an idle thought. Forget I even said that. Um, but at some point, I've got to now decide. It's probably about there. Let's try for about there. So I'm just going to leave that there. Now 322. But the next thing I want to do is just rename this. So this, um, have a guess. Camera 2. Uh, go here, track, actor sequencer, camera two. So I've now got that there. Uh, I know 322 is a frame I'm kind of looking at, but I'm going to go here and just log those keyframes so I know where I kind of initially started from, even if I go back and change my starting point there. And there, got all my keyframes down. So let's. Um, Assume that, and um, we said 322, two, didn't we? Now I've got a second camera in here. If I go to 322, two, and I think I can, there you go, I can numerically type that in, as I thankfully remembered that. I can come up here to my camera track, make sure it's on, go here, camera two. Now, what it's done, it's provided that. <laughs> If anything, given that we were so kind of um, whatever with the previous shot, we might even go in tighter there to because it you know makes it more really we're thrown into the action there. Clearly, we, we would need to attend to the focus. So, um, and this is a point at which uh, because the character's moving, we may not want to. Um, set this on frame zero, but may actually want to use the actual uh, frame itself. And then, so here we go. Uh, let's find camera two here. Let's do the trick of the focal plane. Bring it right forward. There's quite a lot of movement. I could, as I say, if I want to do the salmon thing, set a focal point there and then pull between them, keyframe that. Don't do that. There, okay. Now, the you're gonna get, and in fact, I, I didn't do this with the previous one, did I? Let's just go back to camera one, just so I can uh, point this out. To, to get more dramatic or like more um, narrow depth of field, as you'll recall from, um, if you use cameras, the way that's really gonna um, sing is, so all I'm gonna do is go back to where I set the, da, 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 camera one, thank you. Uh, go back to where I set uh, the aperture. So the, the wider open the iris is, uh, the narrower the depth of field. So if I set this right down to one, then that should um, increase further. I don't know if that was maybe too uh, subtle, but now that's on an aperture um, one, the, the depth of field is even narrower. Uh, I mean, you don't want all your shots to look like that because in itself it becomes a bit uh, but what we were doing, we were in the middle of setting the focal distance. 
and um, I was on this frame here setting that so uh, was I happy with that let's just have a look no that's camera 2 focal distance on that frame that doesn't work as well as 438 now uh, the focus see this might be an instance where you think well really what narrow depth of field um, she's going to be going in and out of focus so I'd maybe increase the aperture and not either set it on effectively autofocus uh, or have different perspective so um, what I'm going to do is actually or more in focus than that let's go 5.6 there so we haven't got too much uh, of an issue instead of moving the camera back I could think now I did talk about coming in closer didn't I so I could set that there maybe uh, burst in the frame top half only now the way to, to know if that's going to work is yeah I think that will work so um, I went to this frame here which is obviously not at the beginning what I tend to do is that's the values I'm going to have if I delete those I've got snap on these now become my new default values and I just move them from the point at which I entered them back to the um, actual area here like this I need to turn off that um, plane because that now was it put on a different camera yeah this sometimes happens it was set for the other camera okay <laughs> pile of fish in the background yeah um See, this would be a point because the, the scene looks a bit if I would run that through some scopes you know there's a lot of white in that scene um, actually the framing I don't like the head bursting there like that so this is something where I'm going to just go back camera 2 and just lift the camera slightly uh, so on there let's go to camera 2 in the viewport there so I need to bring the camera up like that now let's just play through this yeah that's better so there's quite a lot of white in that scene um, I could so you can move the bin around in the world so it was there in the background or just drop in something in the background to make it more interesting um, or change the color of the lights to give them a bit more color interest but anyway um, I've done that so I've, I've shown a transition from one camera to another the same principle will apply um, for subsequent shots drop a camera in uh, get it roughly to the place you want consider the the aperture the uh, focal length and the focus if you want to animate the camera over time then it's a question of setting keyframes at the beginning so we did that for the first one where we pulled out you can um, either animate or do both the focal length or the position of the camera um, you can rotate the camera over time or any combination of these it's really a question of um, experimenting uh, and to provide interest uh, to be empathetic with the source material i.e. the dance and the, the music and the environment um, and to, to kind of be kind of coherent and uh, watchable so there the essential principles uh, guiding the way in which this is done so let us assume that I um, was happy with this uh, you know we've only done even if we stay with that camera shot to there we've only done like 550 frames so we're gonna just export this as if we've done the whole shebang but it's only 550 frames rather than um, 3700 odd that constitute this um, track so what do I do to um, export this what I do is um, just click save there render this movie um, I'm going to save it as an AVI that's probably the, the most uh, useful sequence to save it with now um, 
you can, it says here, master audio submix experimental. Experimental, I think, is too kind a word. I've never got the thing to work. Um, so I would avoid doing that. It takes a lot longer, and then the audio doesn't seem to be there or doesn't seem to be kind of working. You, um, it's set to the frame rate that you set here. I would keep it at that. Uh, resolution, you can go mad. I've um, actually kicked out some 8K videos from this, but seeing as there's only about five people with 8K monitors, um, what is the point other than because it's there? Um, so I'm just gonna stick it at 19, 20, 10, 80. It's kind of you know, fairly uh, reasonable. If you're going for the final edit, you might wanna turn off compression entirely, but you know, file sizes get quite large, even on shortish videos like this. The key thing uh, in this instance, you know, I'm essentially creating a, a kind of a test shot rather than the finished thing. So what I want to do is just uh, limit that to the frames I'm using. So it's 550 there like that. Uh, choose capture movie, ask to save the scene, and then you should see a little preview up here as it captures um, what's gone on. There we go. Shouldn't take too long um, because uh, although I have got a screen recorder going on, I hope I've got it going on. Um, it gives you a preview and then we'll go to the capture folder i'll launch adobe just top and tail it and show you how you uh, link to the audio and then save it out then you can dispatch it to the four corners via youtube or whatever other means of distribution you choose to use or not so i think yep it's done Ooh. and open capture folder there it is let's just play it back See, I would change this now, looking at it in full screen, I think that exit sign is very distracting. Why is that there? So it either remove it from the world or go back to shooting from the other angle. There she's um, doing that there. It's quite a white scene, um, fish. <laughs> okay, um, so I've got the movie. Um, so let's go to here, Premiere Pro. Uh, just launch this in the background. It saves these files under the project folder that you created in um, a saved folder. And there's a, underneath that, this one called video captures. So this is the one I've been using to knock these up. What I need to do is bring in that video file and also uh, an audio file. So let's go to the project here, uh, find the video file. And so it's under projects, Unreal, iClone, Dance 6, probably uh, Dance 5, Dance 6, yeah. And under saved, video captures, there it was. It takes the name of the level. So it's just called demo map and subsequent ones, demo map one, etc. etc. Um, so go here, go uh, right click uh, to new sequence from clip, that's good, and press the slash key to extend it out. So first thing I want to do while I've got it there before I start you know, moving black fade and fade out is uh, thankfully I've, from a previous one I've got the Lucky Duck I brought it in as the WAV file because slightly um, might as well use the file I used elsewhere. Now uh, I remember that I put it on frame 100. Now at the moment uh, my display here well it's 30 frames a second because it's inherited the characteristics of the clip. Uh, what I can do is go up here and choose you know, display frames. And then, uh, can I do the, should be able to, 100, there we are. So now, that's gonna go there, like that, okay? Uh, I don't really like working in frames. So, um, I'm not gonna lock these together. I mean, I could later, but one of the gotchas is, if I lock them together and then shorten this, what would happen is it would shorten the other one, and then that's not too clever. So, done that zoom back in there's the extent of my composition now as you recall I said I wasn't going to start right on frame zero and that indeed remains the case let's just bump this up here like this get a bit of black um, to launch this never had that much black but uh, duration so it's about there yeah, just under a second video track one let's get these pull these back but I'm going to take a little bit off the front of this maybe about that much Pull both of these there, and then do stick a crossfade in here. Or as they call it, um, the cross dissolve. 
and that's given me enough headroom to go from the black to that it doesn't start immediately on that but pretty soon pulls up on there camera should be moving because I had it moved from frame zero and I've lost frame zero so that should be good music kicks in there like that and we just want to top and tail it at the end equally as well so maybe just pull in a few frames here because I'd like the music to fade out just they got snapping on which is always an inhibitor for such things uh, and now I'm too far zoomed in there that'll do so just pull this back it's about there um, do a... no now what I prefer to do um, what I prefer to do is get this physically have some black that I cross fade into so I've got snapping off turn snapping back on snap that to the end there like so now do another cross dissolve there because I haven't pulled enough back off of this have I there that hopefully should do it cross dissolve there there and I want the music to fade out slightly later so audio transition here bish bash there, constant power, put that there. So, um, now what it did strike me is I could have some uh, generic cannery sounds if you can imagine what such sounds might be. You know, salmon flapping in the final death throes or like steam vents because there is steam going on there. Um, so I don't start off in silence, but it is a dance video, not an accurate depiction of life uh, canning fish. So um, maybe I could get away with that. Anyway, um, the one other thing I'd probably do, as a matter of fault, uh, is this video. I think the audio does get a bit peaky. Probably just about on the limit, but I don't like it being that close. So we go up here, audio gain. Uh, Normalise max peak to minus six. Maybe a bit excessive, but you know, no chance of that. <clears throat> so... Let's give it the premiere it deserves. Um, no, wrong one. It's fine. There we go. So let's just check this all works. Go to black. This is camera moves quite slow um, and that annoying exit light. Uh, video's going on. The steam's alright. That works quite well. Why fish in the background? to that point um, but yeah that stop I've heard that enough times okay and then it's just a question of exporting it um, just as I'm doing it so we go export media you can use other video programs the principle largely the same give it a meaningful name so we call this test 02 how meaningful is that really uh, there, YouTube, da, 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 export, that shouldn't take too long. And then, you know, assuming you do this with the finish thing, um, tweak around with the parameters, but then essentially you've got a, um, a clip that you can then um, do with as you choose. So close that, close that. And that concludes uh, this tutorial on uh, working with Unreal Engine to generate a quick dance video.